Hello again. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Dilek Karabujak. Many of you know me. I'm the executive director of the Geographical Society of Philadelphia. Um, thank you for being with us this evening. Um, tonight, we have a wonderful presentation. Actually, it's a virtual tour of the Sacred Valley of Peru. And um, thanks to Alice Sticks, you know, Marco Polo event series. Um, we are wrapping it up the series for 2020 with Jennifer Stein, who kindly agreed to present uh, Peru and her journey uh, tonight. It's going to be a four part um, presentation. So, uh, Urubamba Valley's uh, journey. And tonight, um, Jennifer will talk about the, um, the architectural complexities of the region. As many of you know, um, she is a traveler and independent researcher and a documentary filmmaker, Jennifer, um, in the, you know, from a long list of things, uh, you are a mother, a traveler, and many other, you know, um, club participants and a thought leader in many ways. Um, so if you have any specific questions, um, as you can see at the bottom of each slide, there is a number. Please take a note of that. So it would be easier for Jennifer to get back to that slide and answer your questions or feel free to type your questions in the chat box and then I can monitor those and ask um, Jennifer those questions. At the end, uh, we'll have about 10, 15 minutes uh, for Q&A, um, but uh, without further ado, um, Jennifer, please take over. And at the end, I will wrap it up maybe with a quick you know, um, announcement as well. Jennifer. Perfect, thank you so much. Happy holidays to everyone. So we're going to be following basically a river valley. And this is a map of Peru. And you can see the green part of Brazil coming in here. You can see the Juna River clearly marked there. Well, the Orabamba River is the last kind of blue line in Peru before you get into Brazil that just kind of gives you a sense of where we are. It's high in the Andes Mountains. And the Orabamba River actually runs towards the upper part of Peru. It's not, it's a river that runs towards what's called the um, Amazon basin and the Amazon is lower. So we're going down in the mountains as we travel up the Orabamba River Valley. This is just another view of what we are uh, going along this blue line is the river. You can see Cusco in your bottom right, it's C-U-S-C-O, that's the main city that we land in. And when you fly into, um, when, when, when you go to Peru, you usually fly to Lima and then you change planes and you fly right to Cusco. And Cusco is about uh, 11 to 12,000 feet. So it's, um, when you when the door of the airplane opens, you feel like somebody hits you in the head with a two by four if you have any altitude sickness. Um, even just adjusting to the altitude, even if you're not sensitive to it, it's a little tricky. So these are kind of tricky spots to, to travel to. But we're going to be looking at Cusco and just above it, Saxawama. That's two of the, the sites we're going to be looking at. Um, and then we're going to go back up to that Orobamba River Valley and we're going to look at a place called Oliente Tambo and Machu Picchu. And they're sort of at the top um, left-hand side of your screen. Oh, and I'll just say the four main sites we're gonna be looking at. One is in the heart of Cusco. It's called the Cori Concha, which means heart of the city. One is Saxawama. The other is Oliente Tambo and Machu Picchu. I'll mention that uh, only three of these four sites are actually considered to be uh, World uh, Heritage Sites, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, right now, Oliente Tambo is not, and it probably should be. But this is just a quick overview of these four different sites we're going to be looking at. And what I'm going to be pointing out uniquely in this uh, is building architectural features and how you can um, respect a culture and an early culture by its architecture. When I um, was in college, I traveled with this wonderful group called Up With People, and we spent um, six months in Europe during the period of time when most of you would be taking history of Western Civ. I had a teacher who taught us history of Western Civ through architecture. 
And that so impacted me, it's never left me. And um, so hopefully I'll bring a bit of his insight into this presentation tonight. So when you're in the main city of Cusco, there is Spanish influence and in architecture everywhere because the Spanish conquered Peru and conquered the Inca people in around 1533. You've probably heard of uh, Francisco uh, Pizarro. And so much of the city you can walk around and think you are in a small European village or town. It looks very Spanish. Uh, you could think you were in a village in Spain. Um, this is actually Lima, but uh, many, many courtyards and plazas and lots of Spanish architecture. But what you can also see as you walk around the city are these odd sort of stone walls that lean at about a three degree angle and then current day architecture is attached to them. But what you're actually looking at is old Inca walls or old Inca structure or architecture that's completely been incorporated into new uh, or current day uh, stucco building, you know, done with, you know, uh, just traditional building materials and not these uniquely fitted stone uh, parts. But one of the first places we're going to look at in the heart of the city of Cusco is a Spanish church called the Church of Santa Domingo. So what I'm going to point out to you here is that you can see the Spanish church, but in front of the Spanish church, you can see this odd sort of wall that comes out almost in the middle of your slide. And it's darker stone. It's very tightly fitted stone. That's a uh, diorite. It's very, very hard stone, sort of like balsat. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ball, um, not, yes, ball, uh, balsat and also diorite and andesite are very, very hard, dense stones and very hard to work with. So that is a unique stone wall there in the front, and that's part of an ancient structure. This is a model of what that ancient structure looked like when the Spanish found it. This was the called the Cori Concha, it's an Inca word referring to the heart of the city. And this is a model of what this heart of the city looked like. So there was this ancient wall that kind of was walled in around these inner structures. We don't know if they had thatched roofs, but we think they did. So, um, and then down in the front of this courtyard, there was a bunch of gold standing animal statues, according to the, the Spanish uh, uh, priests that actually archived some of the history. So again, I'll just flip back. You can see that wall here in the front of the Church of Santo Domingo. Here you can see the ancient structure. This is another artist drawing picture of that rounded wall that comes out with that strong andesite large block stone construction and all these buildings that are kind of these long rectangular buildings. The church actually incorporated those, uh, that, that Inca temple right into the church. So I'll kind of go on and explain this to you. This is now what the church of Santo Domingo looks like. It was a convent, it was built around the 1540s. But as you look through the archways across this courtyard, you can see some of the original old Inca structure that's there. So just backing up a bit, I love archival food that it's been destroyed several times by earthquake, built in the 1640s. Then it was destroyed in the 1650s by an earthquake. Then it was rebuilt. And this is the second church that stood till around the 1950s. And then that was destroyed. And now the church that's standing today is uh, this church. And this is the third church that was built. But after on my computer. You, you can't completely read all my text on the right hand side, but I'll read it to you. It's basically native cultural groups demanded that the ancient Inca structure buildings that were covered over by the Spanish be unearthed and restored for tourism and preservation and be opened as a museum. Uh, and that's what happened when they built this uh, final church in the 1960s um, after the, the last earthquake that happened in 19. There's an X pattern in the middle of this central courtyard, and there's a well in the middle, and that was there in the original um, Inca temple complex that was there. So what I uh, hope to imbue or help you to understand is that the Spanish 
really wanted to eradicate any connection that the indigenous people had to their earlier traditions and their religions. And they did that by completely concealing the original Inca structures with the Spanish church. And you'll, you'll see this in more depth. This is the central courtyard. The X marks the center of the city as well um, to the original Inca culture. So this is a good overview of the original, one of the original structures, there are several of them still here, that the church completely tried to conceal. These were rooms used for sleeping and, and bedroom and personal quarters at this um, monastery that was built here originally. And um, it's kind of a really great overview looking out into the church uh, about beyond it. So this is another view, just looking at the ancient Incan structures. So you can see the, right. the white stone. You can see how tightly and beautifully uh, fit these stones are. You can see a slight bit of um, evidence of some earthquake, but really not much. And you can see this angled wall. There's a 3% angle that's used in almost all of their construction. This is me standing there showing you the difference between the large andesite blocks and then the other just you know regular stone blocks that the Spanish were using and where they merged the architecture when they rebuilt the church for the third time in the 1960s. Now, what's very interesting is what that when they rebuilt uh, the structure in the 1960s, they found that under some of the oldest original Inca structures, if they were Inca, I actually often call them pre-Inca because I believe there was yet an earlier civil civilization than the Inca civilization that built these, but they found under these large massive stone structure pieces, these round balls. And it's believed by earthquake specialists that when there were earthquakes, what happened is the buildings were able to wiggle in place much like is done in California and Japan and has been done for the last 25 years. So this suggests that there was ancient knowledge of earthquake preparedness in the people who constructed, constructed these, uh, these sites. So that was, a, that was a composite picture, by the way, of two slides in, in one, sort of showing you the, the structure. So this is another view. You can see how high the ceilings are. It's very strong light. So to photograph this, it always becomes tricky with light. But this is also, you can see the courtyard on one side where that central X is and these continuation of buildings that are just stunning and magnificent, how tightly fit the stone is. This is another picture taken from a book. So you can really see how thick these walls are about 15 to 16 inches thick. They're wider at the bottom and narrower at the top. And all the doorways are the same. They're slightly wider at the bottom and narrower at the top. This is inside one of these courtyards with a group of us standing. You can see the angle to the walls. And uh, interestingly, there are all these little angled cutouts, like they look like mini doorways. We think that they were just alcoves for ceremonial pieces, but some of them were actually open windows. Now, according to the Spanish priests who made records, when the Spanish conquered the Inca, and they found this Cori Concha center of structures of buildings. The Spaniards found these walls coated in plates of gold. And the gold was attached to the wall with like silver nails. Now, silver is a pretty soft metal too. So they had, they were drill holes and they were like silver, silver nails somehow holding this up, holding all this um, gold up. This is another picture of these ancient nail holes that are here. You can also see how tightly these stone pieces are fitted together. You cannot put a pin between these, let alone a credit card or a piece of paper. They are so tightly fitted together. Now, um, there's, uh, there's records that the Spanish not only took all this gold, but then they also tried to uh, extract other gold from the Inca to save the life of one of their rulers called Altahupla, but um, they ended up killing the Inca ruler anyway. Uh, it was part of their way of showing domination over the Inca people. 
This is another picture of more of these holes. And there's also, you can see an open window here, which I think I talk about next. Oh, right. This is an artist's representation of what these original gold walls looked like, according to some of the Spanish priests who actually did some drawings and uh, recorded this. So most of the history we have is really from the Spanish because they did what they could to destroy the Inca culture. They burned their books and imprisoned the elite and murdered anyone who you know, um, tried to keep any Inca culture alive. So here what I'm showing you is a real close up of the fact that there's actually almost a beveled edge between each stone. I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's a very, very, very fine lines on each stone as they fit together. And the stones slightly curve in towards each other. And they also have an incredibly smooth, but very slightly puckled surface. And uh, speaking to some of my friends, they believe that's almost like a glass-like surface that can only be done with very high heat. Um, it's kind of fascinating, but uh, that's some of the theory. So you can actually see Grace here in the foreground of this picture. Here we are staring, looking at some last remnants of stucco and paint that the Spanish had put completely over these walls so that they were so completely concealed, you would never know that the Spanish hadn't built them. This is another example of what the Spanish did. They literally stuccoed smooth so you couldn't see the original stone structure at all. And then they painted over that typical Spanish designs so that any remnant of the former culture was really completely eradicated. So there were probably 150 to 200 year generation of, of original indigenous people who lived here who really did not know what was inside this church until the 1950 earthquake. Uh, this is another example of these amazing, perfect walls that lead out into this bright courtyard in the center. So there are several of these buildings that surround this central courtyard and make up the back of this church of Santa Domingo. Now, some of the windows actually align with one another. And this is what I will, oh, some of them, some of these windows went nowhere. They were sealed up and closed. And we believed they had ceremonial pieces in them. There's no evidence that there were flames in them, that they used them for lanterns or anything like that because there's no burn marks on, on the top of them or staining or smoke or film in them. But um, some of the windows actually lined up and they lined up in incredibly significant synchronistic ways. So that on their summer solstice uh, and on some of their equinoxes, there would be moon or sun alignments that would come right through all of the windows. So the ancient structures were built by a people who I really believe had a good sense of engineering, uh, mathematics, astronomy, um, you know, and understood earthquakes and construction. And, you know, there was just a far higher level of engineering to these buildings than we have maybe uh, really wanted to give them credit for. And depends on what type of tour you go on when you go to Peru, because you usually don't get this awareness. They are, they just, they're called all Inca structures, but really, if you go on a more enlightened tour, somebody with some mm, more historical background, they will point out that these are probably what they call pre-Inca or pre-Columbian history structures. Then you get to some parts of the structure. And as you can see, I just put in question marks because it is very confusing what these stones could have been used for. But just looking at them, any engineer will tell you these were designed for some mechanical purpose whether it was some kind of complex door or something that slid in and came out. It's anyone's guess what some of these stones were used for. Now, this is just an odd little thing I put through in here before we end at the Curie Concha. There is this room in the back of this complex where they just bring these stones from around the city when they're working on a road construction project or they're putting in new sewer lines or they do a, you know, they build a new garage and they have to dig up, you know, and unearth areas for parking or something. And they come across one of these incredibly formed andesite stones. 
they just bring it over to the museum and dump it in the back room. But there's no explanation as to what they are or why they're there. And I just stumbled on these and was asking my guide and the guide I was with didn't have any clue what they were. Finally, when we were leaving in 2004, somebody said, oh yeah, they're just stones they find from around the city. Well, when I went back in 2014 or 2012, the room was full with a, a lot more that had been found in the last 10 years. And when you look at these, again, they reflect complex engineering, in my opinion. And they really look like maybe they were some sort of plumbing mechanism of some sort. Here's a really interesting uh, diorite stone, very, very hard. It's a friend of mine, Brian Forrester, shining a flashlight through this stone. As you get up closer to it, oh, sorry, this one's ball set. As you get up closer to it and you look through the eye, you know, you look through one of the holes into where the flashlight is, you realize that this drill is very complex, very smooth. This And halfway through this large block that's about probably 20 inches by 50 inches high, the drill hole changes size. So the water, so if they say there's fluid or liquid or water going through this hole, suddenly it has to condense down to a hole half the size, which implies if there was water going through it, the pressure just went up by 50 to 60 or something, 70%, because it has to go through a smaller hole. So it was a way of creating water pressure. It's really quite fascinating. And here's just more of these stones. Uh, this, some people say, well, this is a key cut to help hold it to another stone and they would pour metal in it. Well, maybe, but maybe it was used for something else. You know, maybe this is a form of a toilet or something that who knows. But obviously these stones look as if they were, they had complex engineering to them is basically what I'm pointing out. And there are tons of them, tons of them everywhere. <laughs> and you just scratch your head and go, what? You know, what was this for? So now we're going on to Saksawama. Now Saksawama, uh, you, people pronounce this lots of different ways. I've even heard some people call it sexy human <laughs> because it's easier to remember what it kind of looks like. But this is an incredibly complex and confusing site as well. I downloaded a little video for you, which I'm gonna play. So you can begin to see aerially from the air what the site looks like. Part of it is complex zigzag walls. Other parts of it are, look like round ball courts. Part of it is just this unfinished mountain. And the top of the complex has ruins on it that still are defy explanation and no one really knows what this was. Some people think it was a tower, a defense tower of some sort. Other people think, no, it's for solstice alignments. This is still looking down on these large zigzag walls. And this is looking out on the city of Cusco. So you can get a perspective that Saksawama is just up on a higher hill. It's about, you know, a thousand feet higher than the city of Cusco and looks down on the city. And it is a complex and confusing site. So I'll jump into some of the pictures I took. This is looking at the site and the city of Cusco as you see it when you're when you come upon it. So you're usually on a hill adjacent to these zigzag walls. And this is a little panoramic video that I made just with a small little still camera. It's massive and jaw dropping uh, when you stand here and you're confronted by the type of construction that's here. But as you stand on the adjacent mountain looking down at these zigzag walls, you find these amazing cutouts. This is often referred to as the king and queen seat with like the stairs behind it for maybe like the court gestures or the servants to the king possibly to stand upon. But you see this all over Peru, not just in Saksawama. You see cutouts of random rough hued stone. And these cutouts are as smooth as any granite or marble countertop you have in your kitchen. <laughs> they just defy explanation. And then as you walk down a series of carved steps and, and rough you know, hill, hillside, you come upon these three zigzagged walls. And there are three terraces to the main structure that most people visit when they go to uh, Saksawama. And what I point out to you here is that in these three terraces, you will notice that 
each terrace is built in a smaller scale than the one before it. So the, the bottom one, the one that's on the ground level, has massive stone structures and sizes, and the largest stones being on the bottom, and they get smaller as you go to the top. Then you go up one whole terrace and the stones become smaller, and then you go up to the third terrace, and again, each wall is proportionally smaller than the previous wall or the previous terrace. So you see terrorists all over uh, Peru. We'll see, them, see it again, and I'll describe why it's good for farming in a bit. But I'm really trying to point out to you that these gigantic stones um, are uh, mind boggling and breathtaking. And you can see the stones above where there's a person standing, where I wrote person above left. You see those stone structures are really quite significantly smaller and proportionally smaller to the first wall. So again, that implies engineering, uh, mathematics, and a sense of purpose possibly uh, in the, for the builders. And the way these stones are fit together, again, it really defies expl explanation. They're often referred to as polygonal stone fits, meaning that there's multiple ways in which the stones fit together with one another. And it really lacks explanation as to how this could have been done. And of course, this has withstood earthquake uh, for probably thousands of years, maybe, certainly several hundred years, if we believe that the Inca built these in the 1400s. But there's really no evidence the, that the Inca did that. And in fact, there are Inca records that this Franciscan priest recorded where the Inca said they built upon structures that they found that had belonged to the previous culture. This is me standing there in 2004, just to create a perspective on how large these stones are. And what's also very interesting is a number of the stones have unusual cutouts. Sometimes they're cut out or sometimes they're bulbous pieces that pop out. And they seem to be random the way we look at them, but I wanted to note them because I'll point out them in other structures. This is a slightly blurry picture. It's one I actually downloaded from the internet and blew up, but it's looking down on the bottom terrace from the, from the highest terrace. So you can see that these zigzag walls created terraces that were filled in. And if this was a defensive fortress for say protecting the city or for war, you can see how effective it would be and what kind of view you could get and how difficult these walls would have been able to, uh, you know, how these could be defensive walls. The bottom wall is upwards of 16 to 20 feet high, it varies. And it's also estimated that the stones uh, on the bottom wall of Saksiwama are something like, um, oh, well, like, you know, 20 to 50 ton stones. And uh, just a little another note of uh, in interesting uh, uh, metrics, the zigzag wall makes up 400, I'm sorry, 540 meters or roughly 1,770 feet of zigzag wall just on the first wall. <laughs> so as you go up, of course, then that, that multiplies. Now this is the mysterious structure that's on the very top, the third tier at Saksiwama of that filled in land. And it's still a mystery today as to what it was and why it's there and what purpose it serves. And then there are these other odd, odd sites at Saksiwama. There are these things that look like rounded ball courts or rounded rooms or rounded temples. And today just these odd, large, either andesite, diorite, or like our balsat stones sit around. And usually one side of them is perfectly smooth and the other sides are pretty smooth, but it's, it's a confusing mystery as to, first of all, who could move them, lift them, you know, uh, cart them around, put them in place. And this is another example of a ball court. Now I want you to note that this construction may very well be Inca. The Inca described their own building construction as being rounded, rounded stones or, or rounded stones or boulders that they put into place and smoothed and used with mortar and you know, with mud and straw and things like that. So Inca structures look very different than what I will call these pre-Inca structures that we're looking at. But 
This just goes to show you the more uh, higher complexity at Saksawama. So now we're moving on to the site of Oleum Tetambo. This is another high mountain outcropping. When you come to Oleum Tetambo, you, um, well, I'll just say you have to walk through a central courtyard where there are merchants <laughs> selling all sorts of things. And a lot of people spend too much time looking at that and like miss out on really all that Oleanta Tombo has to offer. But you have to walk through this, this uh, courtyard first with all these merchants, pay a fee and then go behind this, this wall and then you can get into the structure. So looking at the structure from the air, just like I showed you from uh, Saksiwama, I think it gives you a nice overview now, apparently, according to Inca lore, all the ancient cities in Peru had an animal reference that they referenced that you could see from the sky, much like you can see in southern Peru, where you see these figures on the ground that are in the Nazca lines and the Nazca animals. It's believed that all of the cities in other parts of Peru also reflected this. And this is an artist interpretation of what Oleum Tatambo actually looks like. And here's a picture just ma mapping the animal llama. It's a baby llama and a mother llama, supposedly, on the landscape. And the main part of the complex that we are going to be going to, and I'm going to be pointing out with megalithic stone structures that defy explanation that are probably pre-Inca, are in the spot of A and B, as you can see in this map, right around the head of the Mama Inca, okay? So going back to the courtyard, you walk across this merchant courtyard and you're, we're gonna go up a flight of steps eventually when we get inside to an elevation of about 9,000 feet. Um, eight, uh, Oleanta Tambo, I'll just point out, it's about 89 miles north of Cusco. Um, it makes up about 600 hectares, which works out to be about 1,500 acres. And it's also right along this Orobamba River. And it's also along the Inca Trail. So once you get right through these, this walkway, this doorway that you have to pay, you know, where the courtyard is, where all the merchants are, you start to see the steps going up. And you see what right out in front of you, Inca construction or small rounded boulders creating terraces which were probably farmed and the these are done with small stone construction and mortar but before you get there you see these odd unusual stones straight in front of you and you wonder what the heck are they here i'm pointing out them again there's like an eye and what i call the eye stone there's these other large stones that look like possibly steps or something. And you assume maybe they fell there by some sort of earthquake. And again, there's some unusual construction right here at the base of the wall, um, which is fairly large construction. So this is the first little plateau. You can see my friend walking along there towards these large stones. And here we are at these large stones where I've just placed question marks because Nobody can tell you what this is, <laughs> what it was used for, how it got there. Uh, is it a series of steps that were used and they fell when there was an earthquake? Possibly. Here's me standing in front of this stone that I call the eye stone because it's cut out to look like an eye. But again, this is very, very hard, dense stone. And you can see behind me, you be can begin to see the Inca structures which are small stones used with, with mud mortar. Here is this eye stone. This is a composite picture I've put together for you with two versions of the same stone, front and back. And I've labeled them. The back is, of course, on the right and the front is on the left. So you can see there are big just big confusions. You know, what, what would this, what was this used for? Was this a series of steps? Was it lying down? Was it standing upright? And no one can answer your questions. Another unusual thing when you come to the site, and I'm sorry, my, my little note is covered by my uh, malfunction of my computer. This black spot is knocking out what you can see where it says notice face. But as you start to walk up these stairs and you stop and take breaths you take breathers on these, these terraced areas where they probably farmed, 
you can't help but notice there's this face of this man carved on the mountain across from you. And looking at this more closely, this is an artist drawing of it from a book. He is referred to as Viracocha, the Inca called him Viracocha. He is an ancient god which, you know, came to uh, South America and founded the original uh, civilization, the original Peruvian people, they believe. And what's very interesting is he is a bearded man, but yet most of Inca men, South American men, are not necessarily bearded. So it's curious that their god ruler had a beard, uh, much like uh, if you look at the uh, Mexican uh, Aztec uh, Quetzalcoatl uh, god stories. He was also, you know, a, a bearded man who, uh, when the Spanish returned in Mexico, the 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 Mexicans thought that, uh, or the Mexican culture thought this was their god returning, and they welcomed him. But actually, it was a Spanish conquistador. So it's quite fascinating. I'll point out that his crown that he seems to be wearing, uh, which is actually a carved crown structure has sunlight hit it on the summer solstice. So the first sun that comes up hits his crown and then it kind of goes across the valley and hits uh, uh, the other structures which we're going to see shortly. So it's just kind of fascinating. I'll just bring it to light. So here I give you a perspective further up at Oleantetambo. This is another breathing point that you take looking back down on this uh, courtyard you walk through where all the merchants are, but you can see it's quite a long hike up and the altitude is quite high. I think Oleantetambo is about 9,000 feet, if I remember correctly, if I can find it in my notes. Um, yeah, it's 9,000 feet. So as you get up to these higher and higher plateaus, you can see the people standing. Now you can see that what would be the head of the llama and I'm going to, where I pointed out before A and B. If you're looking across this mountain now, you can begin to see some odd, large megalithic stones that look like small uh, semi trucks, like the back of a semi truck, just kind of hanging out in solid stone. And it defies my explanation as to how these things got there way high up on top of this mountain. And so now we're going to kind of go there to this area that we're looking at. So as you're walking up these stones, of course, you start to see, again, what looks like Saksawama megalithic stone structures, where you have polygonal uh, fittings of stones and these very unusual walls, and then smaller Inca stones on top of that because the Inca built on top of this pre-Inca culture. Again, defy explanation. In many cases, you cannot put a pin between them. And if you can put a pin between them, it's because the stones have wiggled apart because of earthquake. This is some of our group resting, leaning against these walls. And many of these walls, again, had a 3% incline. You can also see this megalithic structure. And then just across from our group, you can see the Inca stone structure and you can see the clear difference between these architectural uh, features. Here is a group of us. And again, you see these odd looking bulbous structures coming out from the Inca wall stones. It's quite confusing. We don't know what it means. Again, we have our dear friend Grace uh, standing in the background of this picture. Now, as you begin to get up to the top of this plateau, you walk through several archways. This is one where I'm taking a breather with a friend and just to the left of my head, I want you to notice this cornerstone that is fit in place, but the stone actually turns the corner. So here I have a close up of it. So I'm just pointing out the architectural features here that this culture that built with they used large stones that interlocked when it came to fitting stones in corners, and they interlocked their stones together like this. Not only does the stone turn the corner, but it also has an arch up and over. 
And of course, it looks like the stone was put into place and then it was carved to fit the curve. Again, these megalithic stone structures here, some very large stones fit into the natural rock. We're getting further and further up. We're looking back at the Inca building structures and these were most likely terraced garden spots. When you garden in a terrace like this with stone walls, it makes it warmer for the plants. The stones heat up from the sun, that warms the ground, and the ground is warmer for germination to take place. It also is much easier to, of course, plant and, and to harvest on a flat surface. And when it rains, the water naturally drains from terrace to terrace to terrace to terrace. So if you're ever forced to live in a mountainous region, much like the Tibet do, they they farm like this still today. And there are many places in Peru where farming like this continues. So I just point that out. Now this is one of those large megalithic stones that probably weighs upwards of 100 tons. It's got this weird, um, what I want to call lip that comes out through the whole surface of it. It's very smooth to touch, but what's very interesting, and my friend Susie and, and Brian Forrester here are doing, is they are touching the underside of this stone, which I photographed and looked at, but you wouldn't understand if I showed you the photograph. It is as smooth as a polished countertop in someone's kitchen, still to this day. And it's stunning how smooth it is. But so little of it lips over the edge that you wouldn't understand it if I showed you the photo. Plus, I couldn't find it in my records. But anyway, uh, Brian Forrester was always had a tea bar with him, and he was measuring the perfection of all these stones. Oh, this is my uh, my glamour shots. A friend of mine, you know, and I were goofing around on the stones in 2004. You can't do that today. Now this is a main wall of large stones at the top of Oleantetambo. And this is referred to as the wall of the six monoliths. We do not know what the purpose of this was. Uh, modern, modern archeologists think that it was probably an unfinished temple complex, but it is uncertain what it is. But this is a stunning structure, which I'm about to kind of walk you through a little bit. Now, if you look at the fourth panel from the left, you'll see that there is a bit of an unusual design carved into this one panel. It's unclear if it was carved on a number of the other stones, but this is the only stone that still shows it. And that's a typical South American panel that you see. It's also a typical Indian panel that you can see or design. Um, and you see it in the Southwest a lot as well. Uh, here you can see a little bit of it in my photograph just in the center. But this wall of stones is just, um, you know, uh, quite confusing when you stand there and try to figure out what it is. Not only are there six large flat megalithic panels that lean in at this three degree angle, but fitting them together almost like tongue and groove are these small little pieces between these six large flat panels. When I stood there and looked at it, I began to realize that it is much like a tongue and groove wood floor. For any of you who have ever done carpentry work and you've gone to lay a floor, one panel fits in or connects in with the panel that's next to it. So they all kind of link together. And that's how this wall was constructed. But of course, it was constructed with hugely heavy, complex stone panels. Um, this is the design, by the way, pattern that I was showing you earlier when I, when I was showing you this wall and this wall. I see that little square panel, almost looks like a rectangle with little square edges around it. And here's a, out, an outcut of it. You can see things like this all over Peru as well, although this picture was taken in Bolivia. So back to this panel, this is a little movie I made when I was standing there of this wall of the six uh, monoliths. They call it that because they don't know what else to call it, really. Um, but it's quite complex. And these large stones are fit on top of smaller stones that are just set in the ground here. 
It, and there's these large bulbous parts that are jutting out from it. And you wonder, well, why do some stones have these bulbous parts jutting out from it and others do not? It really remains a mystery. Now here, I ran up on top of this wall and, and looking down on it, and you can see how thick these stones are. They're, these monoliths are about 15 inches thick. And the joints that join them together are also about 15 inches thick. It's just mind, mind boggling. All over the top of the complex, as well as all over Peru, you can see large stones with what I call key cuts. And in many cases, there are two stones adjoining one another, and this key cut is cut out to mold both of them together. And the Spanish found iron in these. Now, the Inca culture, and or possibly the pre-culture that was here before, it wasn't clear that they actually had iron, but apparently they did. And in many cases, the Spanish removed the iron and then used it for other things. You can go into museums and see tons and tons and tons of these, these eye-shaped clips that they dug out of structures. Now, here are some of these other odd, perfect rectangles that seem to be lying around as if they were tossed here in an earthquake, which they probably were. And I've only given you a couple of them. I only photographed a few of them, but there are probably 25 to 30 of these things. If you know where to look for them, they're lying around. And these are perfectly smooth, large, probably 20 ton rectangles. And they are perfectly smooth. This is a little video of one of our friends, you know, measuring it all the way across. It's, they were, they're just stunning. I'll just jump ahead. And you see other odd random stones that may be part of a king and queen chair again, some kind of cutout. They may be part of stairs, but look at the small stones that are underneath them. And of course they're covered with, um, this uh, type of uh, uh, lichen that grows on top of the stone. And the lichen itself, the amount of lichen denotes sometimes the age of the stone. There is actually a form of science that tries to date the age of the lichen because that's a growing organism on the stone. You cannot date stone itself. It has to be some sort of organic material that's decomposing over time to do carbon-14 dating. So you just can't chip off a piece of the stone to try to get a date for you know, uh, when it was carved or put into place. That would be an irrelevant and, and uh, impossible uh, type of uh, system. And there are these odd, large ca carved blocks that lie around the side of Oleantatambo. If you walk around this huge complex, which I did many times. Today, modern archeologists and some of the Peruvian people who are there trying to uncover some of these things just find these stones and they try to put them together. Even if they don't really completely line up or match up in terms of the type of stone, or they were probably unlikely originally together, they put them together to show you that they're, they're perfectly carved cutouts in this three degree angle with what I call a beveled inset doorway. It, you think they have some significance, but what it was, we do not know. But they showed some type of engineering. And this is another aspect of engineering you see again and again. There are these underground water tunnels or aquifers that come out in these well-carved well water funnels. And sometimes they are actually, uh, they look like they're actually under some pressure where they, they fall quite, or they've come quite far. And they drop down into these solid carved stone basins. I call them like bathtubs because they are solid like a bathtub is, except in one corner, they have a rounded hole where the water drains down and then goes somewhere else. Where, we don't know, to some other underground you know, aqueduct system. But uh, in many cases, this water comes from mountains within a spring that you're adjacent to, but you don't know where the water source is coming from. And you see this again and again all over Oleantatambo. Now, on my first trip there in 2004, I was running around the site at uh, practically dusk. I had very little light, which is why this is kind of a slightly odd 
uh, brightened photo, but I found this beautiful little dual uh, waterfall coming down into a solid, what I call a bathtub basin that was all solid stone. I actually got down onto it, put my hand down, felt the bottom, it was solid stone. And the thing that amazed me is there were two reliefs coming up from the floor of this solid stone basin that were four-sided pyramids. And where the water came out of the waterfall and hit, the bottom of the basin it hit the top of the pyramids and there were two of them side by side and i was stunned and i thought oh my goodness they must be charging water or something like this it was like wow there's maybe this this culture had some reference back to an egyptian culture you know i hadn't seen pyramids in peru before but there are there are other pyramids but i didn't know about them so I, I was fascinated by this and I photographed it and photographed it and photographed it, but it's hard to see. And of course I was by myself. I couldn't hold the water and take a picture at the same time. I couldn't stop the water. I tried to stop the water with my foot. That didn't work. I got soaked trying to take a picture of these pyramids. And uh, when I went back in 2014, guess what? The pyramids were gone. And the solid stone bathtub was all cut up and there were laid in stones. And there was no longer a solid floor and no longer these relief pyramids coming up from the bottom. And I was shocked because I had run over with a friend of mine. I wanted to show Brian Forrester. This is a little video I made. I was standing there going, I can't believe it. They took away the pyramids. You know? And even where and how the water hit was different too. The water was kind of just not equal, not dribbling down. That's another weird, odd stone that just kind of looks like it's laying against this back wall here. Like there's very little explanation to a lot of things you see there. This is another piece at Oleantatambo, another area where you can go. And this is a waterfall or aqueduct that comes out into an area that's very ornately carved. And there is a pyramid there. And that pyramid was still there in 2012 when I went back, but it's just a single one. Another interesting thing you find all over Peru is you find solstice alignments with shadow lines. So this is just an odd wall area that has these rounded pegs that are relief carved coming out of the side of the wall. Now you'll notice here the shadow lines coming down and I put a little red magnifying glass to show you a cutout of the stone. That's just kind of like this V-shaped cutout. Now look here at the actual alignment of the summer solstice, the shadow line lines right up with this cutout. And you find things like this again and again and again in lots of sacred sites. So now we're gonna go on to our last place, which is Machu Picchu. And as again, I said, I love ancient photographs. This is a picture of how Hiram Bingham found the site in uh, 1911. He found it July 24th, 1911, a young farmer boy had shown it to him. And um, he of course went back in 1912 and really began to start excavating the site. So this is what the site looks like today. And again, just like the other sites, there is a belief that the site of Machu Picchu actually has a significance that you can see from the air. Oh, I'm going to point out, I'm going to tell you the megalithic uh, things I'm going to be showing you here. We're going to be looking at the hitching post of the sun, which I point an arrow to. We're going to be looking at what they call the, the central plaza and the wall of three windows. So this is a central plaza with three walls and just adjacent to it is um, three windows. And then there is also another structure on top of the site called the Temple of the Sun. And those are the three sites we're going to specifically be looking at at the top of Machu Picchu. Um, so Machu Picchu is a World Heritage Site. Um, it was never discovered by the Spanish. And um, roughly just about 30,000 people travel there every year. This was, of course, pre-COVID numbers. And it is about 8,000 feet above sea level. So we have come down about 1,000 feet. Uh, in each of the sites that we've looked at. And uh, I'm sorry, that's the Temple of the Sun that we're going to be looking at. It's kind of hidden. You can't fully see it in this uh, picture. 
Now, believe it or not, there are many people who believe that this ancient site resembles or was built in the shape of an alligator that you can see from the air. And this is looking at the structure that resembles an alligator. Some people also believe there is a wolf carved in the back uh, mountain, which is known as um, uh, Big Hill or literally Machu Picchu behind the whole uh, temple structures that lays out in the ground. So um, let me see, slide 112. Do I have any notes for 112? I don't. So that's what the site looks like today. And there are many terraced uh, plateaus all around it, which is how I imagine the people who lived there farmed. There's also no guardrails in many of these places. So if you're not careful where you're walking, or if you're just standing there with your camera glued to you, which I often am, you have to be very much aware of who's next to you. Because if somebody bumps you, or you step backwards, and you fall, you're a goner. You know, it's like, it's, it's really quite, quite tricky. They're getting better at installing them now, but there have really traditionally never been guardrails in many of these places. And when you get to Machu Picchu, there are these odd stones that lie around and just defy real modern day explanation. Some stones you think, okay, maybe these were used as water pipes. If you put them together, they would form like an aqueduct. And this is what modern archeologists explain how some of this spring water comes out to these uh, little places where you can find it. But then again, you see these odd steps again, just sitting around and you assume they probably fell there through some, site, some type of uh, earthquake. And then in the back of this picture, you can see typical Inca architecture, which is known to be built by the Incas as they described small stones with mortar that they put into place. They tried to mimic uh, the perfection of the former builders, but Inca building is with small stones. Now this is the uh, one of the largest temple complexes on the top of Machu Picchu. It, it's known as the plaza, where the plaza of the three walls and three windows are. It's this central plaza. And the base stones here are huge. You can see this person standing here taking a picture, right, with a white hat. So the base stone behind him is huge. And it has kind of like a, a step that comes down. And then again, it's fitted with three smaller stones that kind of joint it together, like the wood floor that I was describing before, you know, at the uh, six monoliths wall that we saw before at Ali and Tutambo. Again, that large stone is fitted next to the other stone with these three stones that sort of slide in place. Again, you see these these windows or these alcoves with the same shape, this three degree angle. We don't know what that means. The back wall is huge. Here's a picture of this back wall. And the base stone there is huge. And it's even got a cutout in it. It's got an eye shaped cutout to it. And you can see evidence of earthquake here fairly significant earthquake. I actually learned in the process of this presentation that there are, there's a form of archeology span that studies earthquakes and building structures, and they can kind of figure out how significant the earthquake was based on how significant the structure was and how far it's pulled apart, which I thought was really fascinating. And again, you can see the evidence of the earthquake here behind me, and you can begin to see this third wall and again, here is that third wall and you see the base stone that makes up the edge of it. It's huge and enormous. And then these smaller stones are placed on top of it. So this plaza is just adjacent to another megalithic site called the Three Windows. And I don't know if you can see my arrow that comes down there and shows them, um, but we're gonna look at this. This is the, the outside wall of these, this three wall structure. I was just talking about. And uh, here is looking at the whole three wall structure. And you're, I'm, you'll notice the earthquake, severe earthquake damage. I think what I do here, yes, as I show you, that earthquake damage was there as it is when Hiram Bingham found the spots. You can see my little red magnifying glass. If you look at it here, you can see it. Now you can look at it here. And here is here is the temple uh, or the three windows we're going to look at next, which is just adjacent to this three walls. 
And here you can see the same earthquake structure damage today. So whatever happened, happened long before Hiram Bingham found it. And this is the stairway. Jump in. Yeah. Um, it's 8.05. I just oh. Uh, oh, is it? Oh, darn. Okay. No, I so mean, we're just I'm loving it. Everybody's, I'm sure, you know, we're all loving it. And there is uh, so much to hear. But let's maybe wrap it up at 8.15 with Q&A. Um, so if Perfect. you could just, uh, I don't I'll know. I'll just zip through a couple of slides real quick. Okay, let's I think. That, and then we'll have maybe five, 10 minutes for uh, questions. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Thank you. So this is the temple of the three windows, magnificent structure. If you can see out from these three windows right down to the base of Machu Picchu, just look at the, um, how these stone structures are put together. It's amazing. This is opposite looking at that same wall. I put two X's on this cornerstone because again, this cornerstone is carved to make a turn, which is magnificent. And this is the temple of the sun which has sun alignments that run right across that solid stone floor on the, uh, I think it's on the summer solstice or the, uh, the winter equinox, I'm not exactly sure. This lintel stone originally had a, an X, not an X, but a V shape carved out of it where the sun would hit when it came up on the winter solstice and it would shine a, a, a sun line across that central stone. But of course the, uh, the locals, filled it in with concrete because they thought that it would crack. But just look at how this structure is built way up high on top of this stone structure. This is a composite picture of the Temple of the Sun. This is a little movie I made of the Temple of the Sun. And underneath this Temple of the Sun is called the Temple of the Moon, which is carved underneath it out of solid rock. It's just amazing and fluid and organic and looks like something you would see if you were taking ayahuasca. It doesn't even look real. Not that I've ever taken ayahuasca, but again, all throughout Machu Picchu, you see the solid stone cut out bathtubs with aqueduct waters running into them. Perfect stone walls right on the top of Machu Picchu with Inca stone structures also there, but very different architecture large, enormous stone structures. This is the hitching post of the sun. I think it's the last piece I show you here at the top of Machu Picchu. The sun hits this when it rises on the summer equinox and creates a shadow line across the top of the Machu Picchu structures. No one knows what it means, what it refers to, why it's there. Evidence of earthquake. And I just point out some other features about other sites. This is one in Northern Peru called Chavan du Hantar. It's dated to be about 3000 BC because it's got a cave with items that were found inside a large cave structure. But you can see large panel structures very similar to what you see in other parts of Peru. So I believe that there's an earlier culture. I also am showing you quickly references to a place in Egypt that mimics the structures that you see in Peru. You see the back wall of this Osirian temple looks just like wall structures we were looking at in Peru. This is in a temple behind a, a temple called a, a, at Abydos. But you see amazing large stone structures put together that defy explanation. And you see that back wall? This is the temple of the Sphinx in Giza, large polygonal stones put together here. In Egypt, right next to the Sphinx, you can see large stones turning the corner all the way up and down this wall. Looks like we saw in Peru. So I think there was an earlier culture that built some of these structures. This is me inside one of the temple structures. Again, stones that turn the corner. <laughs> you see them in three places here. And in Easter Island, when you go there, and you look at these Moai structures. The Moai st structures stand upon what's called an ahu. Here's the back of an ahu wall. It looks just like the stone structures that you see, identical to what you see in Peru. This is a little movie I made of the stone structure, and I think this is my last, my last slide. That's some of the Moai that have fallen over. You can see their little hands carved. Their fingers hit around their bellies, but they've toppled over. 
but large stone structures covered with lichen. Yep, that's where I am. So good time for questions. Sorry, I went over just a little bit. I get too passionate. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're so welcome. So I'm going to exit back so I can move around if people have questions. And I'll do, uh, should I do a stop share? That would be great. So okay. we can see who speaks. Yeah. That's perfect. But, and if I want to show something, I'll just jump on and do a share screen. So if you have any questions, please unmute yourself, Jack. I see you have a question. <laughs> Was there any concept of what the tools were that they used? Obviously, if they had iron in some of the uh, cavities, they were in the Iron Age. But iron's pretty soft against some of the pretty hard stones that they were working. Any uh, explanation for that? No. That's what is really perplexing. There is not an explanation as to how they could have built it. I have some ideas, but, you know... There's, I, I won't find a mainstream archaeologist who will come up with a theory. I think the aliens had pretty strong lasers. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, if you have a hot laser, if you're going after this with a particular type of laser, you could literally mold the stones together very quickly, taking apart the debris on either side and then fitting them together, just relasering and fitting them and relasering and fitting them. And that would explain the surface, how the surface was as smooth as it was. But it's a controlled laser. It's not an out of control laser. If you hit stone with a high enough laser, uh, like some sort of plasma outburst, you will literally melt or burn the stone and create um, a glass-like surface. But if it's controlled, you'll get a smooth surface, but not a burnt surface. More questions? I have a question. Are all the stones native to the region? Most of the stones are taken from about 20 to 30 miles from where they are. If you remember Oleantatambo, that terrace site? Okay, we know where the quarry is, where they got most of the stones, especially the megalithic stones. Now, this is really interesting. They came from the adjacent mountain almost equally as high as they were. And with binoculars on a good day, you can zoom in if you know what you're looking for and find it. Um, I, there are a couple of documentary filmmakers I know who have gone there on horseback. It's a two, like two and a half, three hour ride by horseback from, from the, the base of the town up this mountainside and you can find the cutouts and you can even find some big stone round lathes up there, which we don't know what they were used for, but that's where the stone came from. So they had to get it down the mountain, then across the river, then up to the plateau. <laughs> Defies explanation. Aliens. It's, you know, I, I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut <laughs> and we'll go on to other questions because I don't like, I don't want to, you know, take people too off, off target. But uh, either that or an advanced civilization that was once here upon this earth that had that technology and we have since lost it. Yes. Unmute. Okay, Jennifer, <clears throat> you know, of course, this, uh, uh, this mystery, let's call it the puzzle, has, has occupied a lot of minds for a long, long time. So I think there was a NOVA program at one time where I think it was a French team. They actually um, took a big boulder from one of those, uh, from one of those uh, quarries and then used... Uh, uh, techniques which could have been used and it turns out that with an awful lot of labor and an awfully long time uh, you can actually make uh, stone blocks like this and doing it by hammering you know so you yes. take a very hard stone and then just hammer 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 yeah gradually I mean they even uh, showed how one of the great mysteries in these constructions is that how do you fit one block on top of the other and make it fit completely, even though they are not flat? Some of them have, you know, a little protrusion or something. Yep. And then, you, then you need to put the, the next one on top, and that has to have a, a negative form in exactly. So how, how are you going to do that? So 
uh, they they uh, essentially um, demonstrated uh, how this could have been done. Um, maybe you want not, not to look for it. I don't know. I haven't looked for the pro for the program, but there certainly is, has been a lot of archaeological. Uh, um, uh, uh, research, if you will. Yes. Um, yes. Speculation, of course, uh, over many, over a long time, because it is an absolutely fantastic thing that they, that this civilization did. And I mean, uh, I mean, if you think about it, um, they must have paid a, a real premium for the highest quality. So, I mean, that wh whoever was in charge of this, right, he, he wouldn't, I mean, you even had, they even had to bevel the, the joints. It wasn't good enough that they yeah. fit. But then, you know, uh, I won't let you get away with this. You know, I mean, right. and, you right. the, and of course, he had a big whip and uh, there were thousands of thousands of people employed. I mean, at least that's the conventional explanation for it. Let's put it this way. Yeah, it's no matter how it was done. And Tom is bringing up a very important point. It shows an extreme level of care and engineering and sophistication and time and effort that was put into it. Yeah. Um, no matter how it was done, whether it was, I mean, I've been into Egypt where they showed you can literally do some of this work with, you know, by, by hand possibly. Um, sometimes even with water, because once you make a, a hole in an area and then you put water in it, the water will freeze and crack the rock and you can break things apart that way. Well, I think but it's more likely to, excuse me for interrupting, more likely to have done it with um, with wooden wedges. So this is French team showed, yes. you make, a, you make a, sl a slit and then you put a, a wooden wedge into it and then you soak the wedge with water. Yes. It expands and then splits the rock. Well, that, I'll tell you, there are places that I studied in Peru that really blew me away because there was no place you could have put wood. So imagine this, you've got a solid wall of rock and you cut out four sides and the back, the back wall. How do you cut the back wall when you can't get to it? And you make a sharp corner in the back. I mean, that implies that you cannot do that with a, with a round rock. So, well, right. And what kind of tools did they have, right? Yeah. So there are some really amazing spots that Mystery. just, yeah. I still scratch my head and wonder. Well, Jennifer, I loved your presentation. It brought back a lot of wonderful memories. And in one of your photographs of so Soxy Woman on the top, I, I never noticed this before. I saw a keyhole shape. And I just recently watched a documentary on the fact that the keyhole shape is all around the world in ancient art, oh, in yes. ancient um, mm -hmm. artifacts and buildings, and even a uh, cathedral in Rome at the courtyard was is a keyhole shape. So that yeah. was interesting. And also some of those odd shaped uh, stones that were collected in uh, Peru, they're similar to what are lying around Bolivia in Puma Punco. Yes. And the T-shaped yes. connector, connectors of the stones are also there too. So that's another yes. uh, interesting factoid. So I've been on a quest to find what civilizations around the world show signs of construction similar to what I've seen in Peru, Ecuador, and in Bolivia. And I think there's something like 16 countries where you can find this type of structure. It's like, you know, and they're amazing. They're all over. You can find it in Tibet. You can find it in China. You can find it in like Romania, Turkey. Um, you know, um, oh, even in places like Isle of, of Man and or Orkney Islands, um, you know, and it's, it's really specific things. There's like five specific things that you have to see. Of course, Easter Island, like I showed you. So I'm in the process of expanding this presentation and researching them all and then pulling them all together and showing people. Um, I so, think and, and China follow up. 
we're due for a follow-up. Okay. <laughs> that might take me a couple months, but you know, I'd love it because it's so fascinating. I mean, I, I waste way too much time researching this stuff, but it really is truly fascinating. Research is not a waste. So we appreciate your research and we appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much. This was Thank a, you. Um, fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Uh, recording and I will share it with everyone. Um, thank you very much, Jennifer Stein. Uh, and we hope to see you again soon. And Alice, thank you for leading our Marco Polo series once again. And stay tuned for uh, more. Um, once we finalize our dates, uh, Jennifer may be back. We look forward to having Tom and Grace back again. Uh, so have a wonderful holiday season, but you'll hear from me via email most likely. But have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Jennifer. Stay safe. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.